first of all, welcome to our Sameach's virtual pre-Pesach seminar. Uh, I just want at this point, this, this is actually the last day of the pre-Pesach seminar, the fifth of our series. I want a special thanks to Nechama Kahana and to Avi Kaufman, because without both of them, this would not have happened. Uh, so although we have not seen them on the screen, they are a major part of why we're able to have this wonderful program. So thank you very much on behalf of all of us. This program is Zecher Nishmas Chaim and Zavakain. Uh, I want to remind everyone that the class by Rabbi Kiva Tatz, which was an understanding of the Pesach on a deeper level, by Yitzchak Breitowitz, an overview of the Haggadah, of David Kaplan, stories that will add flavor to your Seder, and of Yitzchak Breitowitz's part two, which was an overview of the Haggadah, are available at or.edu. You can have them sent to your email, and you can pass them along to friends or review them if you would like. Today is the final presentation, and uh, it's a very, very important presentation, and we'll be dealing with the halacha aspect, particularly to this year. We have with us, originally from Miami Beach, Florida, Rabbi Yehuda Spitz. Rabbi Spitz received his smicha from leading authorities, from Moshe Halberstam Zetzal, Moshe Sternbach, from Zalm Nechemi Goldberg, as well as a Heter Haroa from Rav Yaakov Blau of the Bdats Ede Charedis. Rabbi Smith has served as Rosh Chabora, Shola Meshiv, the Orla Gola, Allah Hakol, Yeshivas Or Sameach in Yerushalayim since 2007. We have prepared hundreds of rabbinical students for Abunus. Rabbi Spitz's diverse and fascinating in depth halacha series has been featured in many international Jewish publications, including, but not limited to, Yatid Naman, Hamadiyah, Mishbacha, Ami, Kashrus Magazine, Ornet, and many others, as well as publishing many halachic discourses. Uh, his much anticipated latest safer, Food Halacha Analysis, was just published in English about a month ago and can be purchased wherever Jewish books are sold. We wish you much success in that new publication, and we're actually excited and looking forward to hearing this presentation. Ms. Spitz, please. Well, thank you, Rab Danny, for your warm introduction. And I'd like to also say a special thank you to Orsamech International for putting together this wonderful pre-Pesach seminar, although it's a virtual symposium, but nowadays, as they say, Gam Zoom Litova. So it's pretty uh, <clears throat> amazing able to pull it all together, um, especially so close to Pesach. Um, Many attend, generally, attend the Shabbos HaGadol Drasha. It's brought down actually in Halacha, there's actually Halacha in Tuf Lamed in Orachayim that says to know that there is such a thing as Shabbos HaGadol. That's an actual Halacha, that the Shabbos before Pesach is called Shabbos HaGadol. So this coming of Shabbos is Shabbos HaGadol. Traditionally, all of Kali Yisrael, many times you don't necessarily go hear a speech or a sermon from the rabbi, but Shabbos HaGadol is a special time to do so. The, it is brought down then in time like this when you have Erev Pesach, Shechal B'Shabbos, that we have Shabbos coming up. Erev Pesach is Shabbos. Since the main point, at least according to the Mishnah Brura, is to learn the proper halachas for Pesach is preempted the Shabbos of God Russia to the previous Shabbos. So many had it this past Shabbos. In recent years, I've noticed that there are some um, shuls, some even Hasidus who do official Shabbos of God during the week. Uh, nowadays, especially with COVID, at least, uh, much, as he said, as much has gone virtual. So for those, it says there should be the Shabbos beforehand. So for those who have not been able to attend a Shabbos, a God will this past Shabbos, since this will be a halach, halachic uh, lecture, halachic drasha, you can count as technically speaking as a Shabbos, a God will drasha, even though it's not Shabbos. And uh, hopefully it won't be darshaning too much, but at least go through the different sheetas and halacha that are uh, applicable in this very special Shabbos <clears throat> Erev Pesach. Um, I like to start with the story of the Levush, of Mordechai Yafo. The Mordechai Yafo was a Talmud of the Ramah, the great Ramosha Israel, the great, great codifier of Ashkenazic Halacha. And he thought to himself, you know, I would like to write my own series on the tour. The tour is an earlier uh, compendium of, of, of all Halacha. Arba Chelke, well, later became Arba Chelke Shulchan Aruch, but first was the Arba Turin. Uh, in the 1300s, the Torah was the son of the Rush. 
And he compiled pretty much all halacha as we know it. He broke it down to four separate sects of halacha, Jewish law. And he thought, I'm going to write myself a pirish on it. Then right when he was about to start, he saw the great Rabbi Yosef Cairo, what we know as the Beis Yosef or the Shulchan Aruch, he wrote not only one sefer, but two sefarim. He wrote the Beis Yosef on the tour as, an ex as a commentary with growing sources and backs of proving an extensive, extensive commentary. And then later on, the end of his life, he codified Svartik Psak into much more basic halachas. We have as a Shulchan Aruch, the code of Jewish law. So he says that, he had what they say, had Chalisha Sadas. He was very disturbed by it. He says, what, what's left for me to do? Then he started going through it. And he said to himself, oh, I see there's a need. The Beis Yosef in his commentary is too long. He goes, cites sources and proves, if you're, if you're, unless you're holding in all the sources and the original words of the Rishonim and the Gemaras, it's very hard to come up with a conclusion. And if you just read the Shulchan Aruch, it's very basic in the halachic. I mean, for basic for him, not nowadays, definitely not. But, uh, and... <clears throat> And he said, it, it's, it's, too, it's too simple. There's not enough background. So he wrote his, his svarim, the, the, what they call, the, he's called the Baal Levush and Levush, on essentially Arba Chalke Shulchan, because he held somewhere in the, a medium, is somewhere in the middle. Not too, not too short, not too long, not too deep, but just enough sources. So I hope in today's drush at least follow that aspect to say what the different sheets are, how we should be running our Pesach uh, up to Seder or Shabbos, a uh, Pesach, but not just giving the basic. I've seen that many places put out one page sheet with just some simple lines do X, do Y, do Z. But at the same point, there's entire svarim that are being written on the same subject. So hopefully, uh, we don't have that much time, but we should be able to get into a little bit of background into the subject matter. So you should realize where are the different sheetas, the different opinions, and where they come from. As avid readers of my insights into halacha column for the Orsamech website, or.edu, and my uh, halacha series uh, this past year in the American Yated Neman, this year, Tushin Pei Aleph 5781 is an exceptional year. This year is called, it was known as a Zacha year, Zion Ches Aleph. This year, there's a little bit of background, there's 14 different types of year cycles that can happen in our 247 year cycle of, of the Jewish calendar based by Hill to Hill Nasiya that wait <clears throat> that he uh, created millennia ago and this makeup of the calendar year Zacha is the third rarest of the of all 14 types of years in the 247 year cycle occurring just 4.32992% those are real numbers. I couldn't make that up. Of, the, of his cycle. And it's also the shortest year. It's only 353 days in the Jewish, of, uh, Jew, uh, Jewish year. And it occurs on average only once every 23 years. Why am I bringing this up? It's because a Zacha year ensures that there's going to be many unusual and rare phenomena that occurred this past year, besides, of course, Corona, and COVID, but uh, whichever one we want to go with the American Israeli no so. But there, it creates very many rare things that occurred, rare phenomena that occurred this past year and are still recurring. Some of them, like the first ones, what does Zacha stand for? Zion <coughs> stands for the first day of the year, Rosh Hashanah. What did Rosh Hashanah fall out on? Zion was Shabbos. A Shabbos Rosh Hashanah is very interesting in itself because we don't blow the shofar. We leave aside the mitzvahs asay the rice of blowing the shofar in order for keeping Shabbos, and we only blow the shofar the second day, which is the Rabbana. That itself is very rare. Ches is referring to the months of Cheshvan and Kislev, but sometimes different years they switch off whether Chaser, which means they're a 29-day month, or, or they're Shalim, a 30-day month. So they switch off during the course of the year all the different months. But those two are the only ones that are wild cards. They can switch off between 29 and 30 days. This year, there were both chaser, both 29-day months. Therefore, it, hence, that shortens the year by a day. And Aleph is what day of Pesach it falls out on. Okay. 
So Pesach falls out on a Sunday. We know Lo Adu Rosh Hashanah doesn't fall on Sunday, but Pesach definitely does. Lo Badu Pesach. Pesach doesn't fall out on a Monday. So when we have a Zacha year, many strange occurrences happen. And one of them is this one, Erev Pesach Chal B'Shabbos. Actually, the one that was most recent was Purim Mishulosh, which is a three-day Purim, which occurs only in Yerushalayim. For most of us in the world, we had just a rushed Friday, and Purim fell out on a Friday. But in Yerushalayim, which holds Shushan Purim Tezvav, right? It's like the walled city it's from Yeshua Ben Nun. So they keep it on Shabbos. They have essentially a three-day Purim, Purim on Friday, Different aspects of Purim are kept on Friday, different ones on Shabbos, and different ones fell on Sunday. So it's a Purim Shul, it's a three-day Purim. I mean, I guess you count the hangover, I guess you can drag it into four days, but at the same point, it's really Purim Shulish. So, but whenever you have a Purim Shul, exactly one month later, you have Erev Pesach, Shechal B'Shabbos, is what's occurring this week. Now, generally speaking, Erev Pesach is the busiest day of the year. But when the cup falls on Shabbos, then essentially everything really goes into high gear. Now, why did I bring up the permisholish? That was already last month. And the answer is because in 1910, the Rav of Yerushalayim, the old city of Yerushalayim, was Rabbi Yosef Chaim Zonenfeld. He wrote a small sefer, a small kuntras, I assume it was probably paperback at the time, it was printed in 1910, called Seder Permisholish. And he threw in the back, he says, the Hilchis. Erev Pesach Chal B'Shabbos. Say your Erev Pesach Chal B'Shabbos. The entire Sefer, if you want to call it that, is 13 pages with large print. And he wrote in 1910. Now, Rabbi Yosef Chaim Zonnefeld was one of the leaders of the old Yishuv in, in, in Yerushalayim, and he was essentially Koveil, many of the halachas. His grandson-in-law was Rabbi Chil Michal Tukachinsky, who was known for creating what we call Minig Eretz Yisrael, compiling Minig Yisrael, Luach Eretz Yisrael. So many of them in Hagim that are kept, the people I know that we do is as many of Shalayim, essentially flow through Reisel Chaim Zonnefeld as he was the grandfather, so for Luach Eretz Yisrael will always be quoting his grandfather-in-law. So when someone as great as a God of Torah, Reisel Chaim Zonnefeld wrote a small sefer, it started a genre, even though this is very rare, how often that, that uh, Erev Pesach, Shechal B'Shabbos actually occurs. In fact, it doesn't only occur with the Zachir. The last time we had this was 13 years ago. We're going to have it again in another four years, Erev Pesach B'Shabbos. And then there's going to be a break in, in, for 20 years. And it's going to be 2045 be the next time. So essentially, anytime this happens, it's considered a, a rare enough occurrence that, you know, everyone like drops in. What, what, what should we do about it? What should we, what, what are we, you know... How do we deal with this? What are the halachas? And the halachas actually are pretty quite complicated, but we'll hopefully we'll wind the path through them to come to a uh, easy enough conclusion, at least what the different sides, the different opinions are, and so we should know exactly what to do. Because as Misha Brewer says, the point of a Shabbos of Galas Rasha is we should know halacha lamaisa what there is to do, what the different opinions are, at least how we should best fulfill uh, our. Uh, Obligations, how to keep the mitzvahs properly. So let us start for Erev Pesach Chal B'Shabbos with beginning, Tainus B'chorim. Tainus B'chorim, generally speaking, is on Erev Pesach. That is when the B'chor, the, the uh, B'chorim fast, due to the fact that they were saved um, in Mitzrayim, that the, the B'chor uh, Mitzrayim were punished, they were all killed out of Makas B'choros. And the and the Yid and the Jews were saved. It's therefore, they, they they have a they have a way of fasting. They're supposed to be fasting Erev Pesach. Nowadays, most people potter with the Siyum, but what day is it? Erev Pesach is on Shabbos. Obviously, you can't fast on Shabbos. So then, we would think, hey, maybe we push off to Friday. We have another separate rule: that unless the fast is explicitly falling on Shabbos, like a Sar B'Teves, which is the only one that does fall on a Friday. There's all sorts of reasons for that. Some say it's because it says in the pasuk. In the Navi, that on this specific day of the siege of Yerushalayim, is the same, uh, therefore, it, it, hayom hazeh, therefore, that same day we always have to fast. But otherwise, Erev Pesach time B'chorim doesn't have that. Therefore, Thursday is always considered a much better day for fasting than Friday coming into Shabbos starving. Therefore, it's pushed off to Thursday. 
similar actually to Tainus Esther, which also if it's pushed off, also gets pushed off to Thursday. So all the posts can say that, that if those who are fasting, the Bechorim or Shahir the Siyam, will really be on Thursday as well. Um, it's known that the stipler going had extra chumr, he'd make another siyam, the Seir Chaim Kaniyasi does as well currently, to have another siyam on Friday, just in case that maybe it's a different day. But it doesn't seem to be, I mean, that's Durhan Haga, but at the same point, in the Sifre Halacha, it seems to be Thursday is really the main day for fasting. So now we come to B'dikas Chametz. It's not going to be Friday night. So when is B'dikas Chametz going to be? B'dikas Chametz will also be done a day early. So that means, although Erev Pesach is really... On Shabbos, Friday, as Erev Shabbos, Erev, Erev Pesach, is going to take on the role in many ways of Erev Pesach normally does in a regular year. So B'dik HaShamas will be held on Thursday night. So we'll do B'dik HaShamas Thursday night. We'll say that Kol Chamira, which will only be the Chamas we know about. And Friday morning, we're supposed to burn the Chamas that we know. So... You take your comments, you'll burn it. Now, does it have to be Friday morning? That's an interesting question. Technically speaking, I'm allowed to have comments till Shabbos, five hours into the day. Why should I burn it? But anyway, the halacha is, it's still preferable to, to burn it on Thursday as well, in the same time you generally would in a regular year. Because if you do one year off, what's going to happen is, we're always worried that maybe, you know, the next year you're not remember. You'll say, yeah, I remember I burnt it later in the day when it was already also for me to have any Hanaf from comments. Therefore, it's always better to try to stick to the original timeline and time frame reference that there is for a regular um, Erev Pesach. So the same way a regular Erev Pesach, we should try to burn our comments for the Zman Sof, uh, Zman, Sof Zman Sof Zman that will be yeah, on Friday as well. Uh, there is a difference, though, in a regular Erev Pesach, we say that uh, you should stop the Malacha by Chatzos, including getting haircuts, maybe cutting nails, there's a difference of opinion, but this year, since it's pushed off and it's not really Erev Pesach, you can technically get a haircut, Kavad Pesach, Kavad Yantif, even much later in the day, as necessary, without on coming to any uh, real deal Halachi Shilas. After that, and of course, in regular Erev Shabbos is not enough, and you're burning your Chametz, but the kol chamira that we say after burning your chametz, you don't say on Friday. Because how are you going to have suudas on Shabbos? We're going to get to that. We we'll actually spend a lot of time on that. Which suudas and how we're supposed to make suudas on Shabbos. But until we get to that point, the point is you're still going to need to have some chametz around, generally speaking. Unless you're in a hotel or some place with little kids or they're going to be, you're afraid they're going to throw it all around. But generally speaking, the kol chamira is actually recited not on Friday, but rather on Shabbos before the Zman of Sos Serefas Chametz. The one that you say that you're being Mavatal nullifying all your Chametz. But the question is, when do you, are you supposed to do the prep work for the Seder? Now, generally, uh, Friday is, or Shabbos is busy enough, but really, uh, many different, many posts can bring down that the prep work for the Seder, for there's certain things, for example, setting up the salt water, uh, grinding, if you're using horseradish for marrow, the grinding of it and uh, uh, grating and grinding it up should be done and put a set aside from before Shabbos already on Friday. Definitely don't want to do it because there's always going to be a problem from certainly from Shabbos to Yantif. If there's already a problem from one day of Yantif to another, certainly now you have coming upon a three-day Yantif. For those of us in the Chutzar, it's supposed to be a two-day Yantif, but you're, or Shabbos Yantif, you definitely want to do as much prep work as possible beforehand. So that means setting up the salt water, grating the marrer. For those using lettuce, which technically speaking is the truer marrer, that lettuce should be, the romaine lettuce should be, or even if you're using endives, whatever checking you have to do and soaking and getting it ready, all those things might be problematic on Shabbos itself and certainly as a hachana. So any types of Seder preparations that you can do, get rid of or take care of on Friday, it's always going to be much better that this is brought down, that we should be taking care of those um, on Friday, not to get into any problems of Hachanah getting ready for the Seder, doing something that may be prohibited, or not be able to do it itself on uh, Seder night. So include also roasting the egg, although, or if you're Sephardi, cooking the egg, and uh, roasting the shank bone. Also, all those uh, Seder prep work should be done on Friday. Now, what I find interesting is Rabbi Yisrochaim Zonefeld writes, in his Sefer, in his little country's, that he says, if you can have a separate table 
set aside in a separate area, already set up with all the Seder ready to go from before Shabbos, that's optimal. Now, obviously, you can't say that that's a chiyuv, that's an obligation. But at the same point, I mean, I, I believe that we live in larger houses in <laughs> easier to clean areas than Rabbi Yosef Chaim Zonnefeld lived in the old city of Yerushalayim in 1910. And yet he is saying, if you could set aside a separate area or separate with your Seder table already fully set, you have everything sitting out ready from Friday afternoon to last you until you start the Seder uh, after Tzaysik Vechofim on Motzi Shabbos. Wow. I would say either he didn't have a lot of little kids running around, but uh, I don't know. But that's, that, that's, that's pretty incredible. But uh, so for those of us who are able to do that, it's, that is brought down that such a major prep work is actually advised, if at all possible. So now we come into a question. Now we have our Seder prep work all set up. We did Badikas Chametz. We even uh, burnt our Chametz Friday. We're getting ready for a Kol Chamira on Shabbos Day. How do we have our Shabbos Sudas? Because here we have a problem. And the truth is, there is no one word answer. And whatever we do on this uh, very busy day, there's no one word solution and there's no one right solution. There are many different solutions. There are many different, well, several different options and several different solutions offered by the different poske hedoros and how they paskin to Shiloh. But there is no one way. And it comes out very different whether someone is Sephardi, whether someone's Ashkenazi, and potentially, possibly, even if someone's Hasidish or based on your own family's minhagim, they might change how we should um, have our su'udas. Now, the main problem is like this. There's a Yerushalmi that says, it is usur, wait, uh, before you get to the Yerushalmi, let's get to the question. How do we have our su'udas this Leil Shabbos? If I'm eating chametz, right, because I can have chametz, so so is my chametz, which here in Eretz Yisrael, the clock is going to change. I know it did already over there in America. So is my chametz, chametz over here is going to be 10, 10, or some clock, 10, 11, if we follow the more stringent sheet of the Magen Avram and how we divide up the day with Shalzmanius from dawn until from Elisha Shachar until Tzitzik Chav until nightfall as opposed to sunrise to sunset like the Gra and the Shulchan Aruch Harav, which the Mishabura recommends for Chametz that for Shalzman Achilas Chametz we should follow the more stringent option. There is a later option. You, you gain about a half hour, possibly 36 minutes. I uh, know you get 36 minutes at least. But okay, depending on how we Cheshman it out. But the same point, that's pretty early in the day. If we're going to have chametz, first of all, should everything be chametz? What about what kalim that we cook on? What are we going to use if I get rid of my pots? I already burnt my chametz on Friday. What am I supposed to do here? Or is there a possibility of eating matzah? I mean, matzah is for a little Seder. It's not Pesach yet. So what am I supposed to do? That essentially is the question. So let's go step by step. And let's go through the different options available and what the different potential problems or issues with each of these options is. And hopefully we'll come to some potential solutions and we'll discuss how many, how Sephardim will have one, one view, how Ashkenazim will have a different view, how and even in America and Israel, there's a separate minhagim in how to have our sudas on this very uh, unique Shabbos. Okay. The first option is chametz. You have chametz. So, how can we have a chametz suuda if we're getting ready for Pesach? Especially for Farm Joseph Chaim Zonfeld, we have a whole Seder table set up in the next room. How are we supposed to have chametz? So, he himself writes, what we should do is cook, and the Mishra Bru brings down that this is a, a, a uh, minna back in Europe, that you should really have everything Pesach dick. You should cook Pesach and Pesach Kalim, switch over your kitchen, to keep a few bits of chametz aside. They have, to have it maybe double, triple wrapped separately. Keep it down to the side, maybe, and, and many bring down. Um, use, you should use Pesach Kalim, Pesach dishes, set up everything all Pesach thick, and keep a little bit of chametz aside in a bag. And you come to the side, and you have enough there to, to be able to wash 
enough kezayis of 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 uh, of chala for everyone. Keep to the side. Many nowadays say instead of using chala, it might be much smarter to use pita because pita, at least in, at least in Israel, this is very widely uh, accessible. Pita itself does not crumble anywhere near as much as regular bread or challah. So if you have a side for Lech Misha, two pito, two pitas, then you can very simply and easily push that aside, have it wrapped up, and eat it on a little separate tablecloth. There are those who say, the Chazanish is brought, is brought down in, a, in his Koyvitz uh, Igris, brought down Orphus Rebbeinu as well, that he would do is he would eat it on the, and even the stiper going himself would eat it on the porch, to keep it a little separate, eat on the porch. Now there's a question is, how can I eat that on the porch? Am I supposed to have my whole suit on the porch? So I might say, I have all my suit on the porch. It's an easy cleanup. And as Rabbi Yosef Elio Hankin says, he writes that you should ever have disposables. Even people don't generally use disposables. This Shabbos, everyone should use disposables. That's what they're for. The, when else could they have been created if not for ever Pesach Shachal B'Shabbos? Disposables, the way to go. Don't ask what are they going to say, what about Shaduchim? Because whoever you think of being Mashadich with, they also will be using disposables as Shabbos. At least they should. If not, maybe you don't want to eat by them. Maybe you alone should be wanting to go to the third Shaduch. Anyhow, if you, even if you have a disposable plastic tablecloth over what you're eating, you can simply wrap up the chametz you're doing and take them and throw that out. At least until Sov Zaman Sreifas Chametz. So <clears throat> the Minchas Yitzchak, who was the Av Beisli and Eidach Reis Yushalayim, he says that even if you can make the suda, you can even split up the suda as part of on the porch. We're talking about here Friday night. Maybe make kiddish and have the uh, hamotzi part on a porch or on a stairwell. Some of the, and then you could very easily on, on a disposable tablecloth quickly wrap it up and throw that throw that in the garbage. Usually you should be good to go then. If it, even though generally speaking there is a hesitancy in halacha to say to move the ochre in the middle of a suda to walk some other place, even if it's all on your property. He says in this case, for the halach is for a mitzvah oiveris, a passing mitzvah, you're allowed to do so. He says, what could be more than a passing mitzvah than being able to be kayim, to be able to fulfill your suda Shabbos? So many poskim, especially in Eretz Yisrael, they say this is the way to go with not only the Friday night suda, but the Shabbos day suda as well. Excuse me, please. So that way, when the time comes for Sof, Zman, Achilles, Chametz, you can quickly brush off your clothing, sweep up the area that you ate this Chametz in, and you could take that and toss it in a public trash bin, or if there's any crumbs left, take the crumbs, sweep them up, and you could flush them down the toilet. And then you could say, Kol Chamira, properly. This method seems to be the uh, method that many uh, Gedolei Poskim and Eretz Yisrael say prefer for this uh, Shabbos. Now, the problem with that is, or a problem with that is, even if we're able to fill this, fulfill this properly, what do you do about Shal Shudas? Because Sozman Achil Chametz is going to be a 10-10 in the morning. What are you supposed to do about Shal Shudas? So they maintain that you should wake up early and have a daven earlier, possibly Nate's minion, and split your sudas into two. The Chaznish says he used to have an early morning milchik suda, have a break in the middle. He says he would take a half hour, although others, the Moshe Sturmbach in his chuvas says that that's not necessarily necessary, but rather Akira Sashulchan getting up and benching, perhaps taking a, a short walk, if not, doesn't have to be actually a half hour. Again, there are different sheetas on this. And then rewashing and having a separate suda then. And that way, at least according to one shita that will allow you to have a shal shudas in the morning, you'll be yod to your din of shal shudas with actual hamotzi, which is a preference for being fulfilling uh, uh, shal shudas. So the shlishi is supposed to be done with <clears throat> with actual bread. So at least that way, um, you'll fulfill that that uh, obligation. Uh, many bring that down. Others say. If it's too much to do the split the suda, maybe it's a problem of bracha she'en tzricha. Maybe it's a, you don't need this blessing. Some say you can, or you want to start a little later. It's definitely not an obligation to do. Rather, it's viewed as a hither mitzvah, a mitzvah in a muvchar, perhaps a nice thing to do, a general um, way of making it a more optimal situation than it was beforehand. So there's definitely one mahalach in fulfilling eating chametz, and then. 
um, quickly cleaning everything up in the area before Sov Zma and Achil Aschametz, saying Kol Chamir, sweeping everything up, throwing everything, whatever crumbs remain into the garbage and flushing down the toilet. And then, and then, um, then you can actually say Kol Chamir and you can actually continue your Suda as long as you like with Pesach like food. Because again, you cooked everything uh, with, in, in, with uh, <clears throat> Pesach like food. Basil Kalim, therefore, there's no real problem that you can continue your suit as you as regular. And if you're Mikhaim Shalash Shudis, then great that you're able to Mikhaim an extra thing as well. The problem with this is, as some bring down, perhaps there's other shitas that say you can only be Mikhaim Shalash Shudis after davening Mincha in the afternoon. Again, preferably bread. So there's no way for an Ashkenazi to be Mikhaim this. However, Svardim might have a different option, which leads us to. Option number two, matzah. Are we allowed to have matzah in every Pesach? And every have, maybe have matzah in my Suda. Maybe someone has to be tight, so why can't I see matzah? And the answer is there's a Yerushalmi that says that anyone call oichol matzah on every Pesach, and the Toys just brings it down to the beginning of Perk Arve Psachim, that anyone who eats matzah on every Pesach is a sort of jumping the gun. It is like someone who co-inhabits with his fiance in his father-in-law's house which is not a, uh, let's just say, Judaism does not look very kindly upon that. So, hence, it's considered a bit of a curse or a klala. Therefore, there's something you want to stay away from at all costs. So, therefore, what do we do? If you can't have the matzah, we have the chametz option. But is there any sort of matzah option? And the answer is sort of. There's really three separate opinions in the Rishonim. When this prohibition on matzah starts, some say it starts in the night, Others say only in the daytime. And third opinion is only from the Zman of Isser of eating uh, chametz, which, of Doraisa, which would be from Chatzos. Now you saw Zman Chilas uh, Chametz, uh, you have a little more time. Now, most authorities pass in from daytime, which means according to them, you can technically have matzah as part of your suda at night. However, that is not that simple to rely upon. And uh, others are very mocked with that it means no, even from the night. Ramosha Feinstein has a very famous shuv on the topic in Igris Moshe, Chelek Aleph, Simon Kuf, Nun He, where he says that really we should keep it for the entire uh, Arab Pesach period already from the night time. But if someone wants to rely upon the many opinions who allow it at night and just prohibit from the daytime, you should not, uh, you should not make a fuss or admonish him or anything of the sort. These are what to rely upon. However, for the general public, and it's definitely not something that we would want to say as for everyone, should least do the chachila. And anyway, even if one would rely upon a, a matzah for the night, it doesn't really help you for the day. So the question is, are there other solutions then? And the answer is yes. So right in the beginning of Parak Arve Psachim, the Gemara says, or the Mirla Mishra says, that we're not allowed to eat any sort of bread-based product, Kovea Seuda, from Erev Pesach, from the 10th hour, from the half hour before Minchiktan, the 10th hour of the day. That's in the mid-afternoon, be, uh, or essentially three hours before the onset of Yantif, because you should be come into a little bit hungry, a little bit with an appetite, in order to be able to eat your matzah, probably everyone's a mitzvah, chilas matzah, on Leil Seder. So in order to be able to properly have the right appetite to eat. So that is a, that is not only the Mishnah, the Gemara Pasnet way, the Rambam, Shulchan Aruch, all the codifiers, they also, that is the Halacha Psukha, you cannot do that. So Taisus over there asked a the question, if I know I can't eat matzah the whole day from the Yerushalmi, then what is they talking about? I can't eat chalmet at that point in the afternoon. So what was the, the Mishnah referring to that I, that I can eat all the way up till mid-afternoon every Pesach? And Taisa's answer is matzah ashira, enriched matzah. This is what we call nowadays egg matzah, although the name egg matzah is technically speaking a misnomer. It's really mostly uh, 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 manufactured with uh, apple cider. There are eggs in it, but really with apple cider, apple juice, or grape juice. So egg matzah, we have egg matzah. So you can eat egg matzah until the three hours before the onset of Pesach, so mid-afternoon. So... And the Shulchan Aruch paskins accordingly. He says, yes, yeah, this is what we should do. In Simon Tov Mem Dalid, in Shulchan Aruch, there's a, 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 a Simon Halacha, Din Erev Pesach, Shechal Yos B'Shabbos. And the Shulchan Aruch, Rabbi Yosef Cairo, the great codifier of Halacha for the Sardin, 
says, he writes that our boss is Chalish Veshavis. What should we do over here? And he says, you should eat. He says, you should leave over enough food for covered Shabbos, Tzayrach Shabbos for two meals. And in the Suda Shlishis, for Shabbos Shodas, the Zman is Achar Mincha, you should dive in Mincha first and eat afterwards a real Suda Shlishis. At that time, you cannot eat matzah or chametz, but rather, the matzah ashira. But instead, you, should, you have to eat it before the 10th hour. So he says, you should use matzah ashira, egg matzah. So according to the Svartim, they can have egg matzah, or, and they can eat it. They can have all three sudas and fill, according to the Shulchan Aruch, you, can, you don't have to wake up early in the morning. Erev Pesh Chal B'Shabbos. You can daven regular Shabbos time, have one regular suda Shabbos with egg matzah. You can have a second one in the after, you can have it your night suda as well. And you can even have it on, have a shal shodas in the early afternoon after davening mincha gedol. Now it's interesting that they say daven mincha gedol because if you go to the Gemara Mpsachim, the Mishnah Gemara Mpsachim on Nun Ches, one of the actual sources that allows us to daven mincha during the entire year this early only a half hour after Chatzos, because generally speaking, we know that the tefillahs are related to the Karbanas, and Thomas Shobain Arbayim is generally speaking, is only given and offered in the late afternoon in the time of the Beis HaMikdash. So where do we know that you're allowed to even daven from that early in the afternoon? The Mishnah says from Erev Pesach, since you have to do the Karban Pesach also, the Karban Talmud was brought much earlier. And the Mishnah says in Erev Pesach, the Shechal the Arab Shabbos, they bring it so early from Mincha Gedola. And of course, the whole Gemara over there, and the Gemara concludes with Rabbi Kivas, and according to Rabbi Kivas Shito, and includes the Arab Pesach Shalios, the Arab Shabbos. So a year such as ours is actually the Makor, the actual source for allowing us to in any day of the year so early in Mincha Gedola. So, so it's quite apropos for us to dive in, you should dive in this Shabbos as well, you should dive in Mincha, Mincha Gedola. That's an interesting side point. But so back to our question over here. It w- does, then we're back to matzah, shira, egg matzah. According to Shulchan Aruch, we can all have egg matzah, three sudas on Shabbos. Here's a wonderful solution. And the Sephardim essentially, at least mostly, paskin this way. Comes along the Ramah, though, and he argues, and he says, Uva Medina is elu, the great codifier of Moshe Israelis, the great codifier of Ashkenazic Psak. Ashkenazic law says, Medina is elu, egin lechel matzah, shira. We don't eat, our minig is not to eat matzah, ashira. Like I explained later on, Simon Tov Samach Beis, the kind of the shlishes you should have shalashodes being a peris or baser vidogim with fruit or meat or fish. So Colin Roy says, no, you can't, you can't eat. We don't eat a hold of matzah shira, certainly not that late in the day. And therefore, the only way to have a the kind of a proper suda shlishes is if we would eat it with shahako food items. Instead, so we're beyotzi, but the oven is the halacha simon. Reish tzadik aleph is halachas of 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 of, uh, of shal shodas on Shabbos, and there's different halachas of what the proper. Obviously, hamotzi make on bread is is the optimal way of going. So, or mizonos, the lesser level. Throw so, a shahako if you're stuck. But see, and the also question of timing is question if you're allowed to do it earlier or later. The Ramad didn't seem so bothered by allowing because there's different sheets that allow you to have. Shal Shudas in the morning. The Shulchan Aruch, though, as the Kafa Chaim points out, did not allow it. Therefore, the Shulchan Aruch himself had to say, no, we have the Matzah Shira, and you have to only have Shal Shudas in the afternoon. Because otherwise, after Mincha, it is irrelevant. It's not considered even eating Shal Shudas if you split your Suda. So for those who follow the Shulchan Aruch, you would have to have it only after, after, after Mincha in the afternoons. So that's why the Shulchan Aruch solution is optimal for Sfarim. So now that we have a problem, though, what do the Ashkenazim do? The Ramah essentially says you cannot have matzah ashira. And he references Simon Tov Samach Beis, a little bit later on, where in that Simon, in Halacha, they're referring to different ways of making matzah. And the Ramah writes over there, they're talking about uh, may pears, making with uh, uh, fruit juice, essentially egg matzah. And he says, in Medina is Elu in our countries, and no again Lolish May Paris, we don't uh need the dough with May Paris, fruit juice, a feel like toy fimats, and no again rack akhav yasum and chamin, the ain't the shanos. And he does use strong word. We don't change, there's no we don't do this at all in Pesach. In Loi Bishasad Chak, unless it's Shasad Chak, 
extenuating circumstances, for a chola or a zaken. So the Ramah is telling you, he's applying the same halacha here across the board. Even though over here in Tav Samach Beis, he's referring to, he was referring to on Pesach itself, we see that he wanted to apply it as well to Erev Pesach, the same would apply. Or did he mean that? Because there's a third mention in Simon Tuf Ayin Aleph. Over there, the Shulchan Aruch brings down again that before the 10th hour on Pesach, we can eat a matzah, a shira, then rich matzah, egg matzah. And the Ramah does not argue over here. Many later poskim say, hey, what's going on here? This seems to be a contradiction in the Ramah. One place he says, we don't do it at all. Another place he says, only allowance is for sick people or the elderly or people who can't eat regular matzah. And the third place, he doesn't object in the slightest. What's going on? What, which is the Ramah's true shita? So as with many things in halacha or even Judaism, there's no one word answer. It's a big machlok is acharonim, what the Ramah's intention really was. So there actually is a, some, several authorities, they understand the Ramah to be ruling the same way Matzah Shira is prohibited on Pesach, it's prohibited in Erev Pesach as well. The Vilna Gon ruled this way as well, that we cannot eat egg matzah on Erev Pesach. Accordingly, if we follow this understanding, this would not prove a proper solution for Ashkenazim at all on Erev Pesach called Shabbos. However, others, they cite the fact that Ramah does not argue in the third time when, when the Shohar, they meant that really he essentially holds it's permitted. In fact, the Aruch HaShulchan says that the only reason Ramah said that is because he meant it's not worth it to produce matzah shira. If you're doing a commercial bake, you're not going to do If you can only make it for one time, one day, one meal, it's not worth it to do. So you're saying it's not worth it to try to work, get together, to work out to make this egg matzah, but not that it's essentially uh, prohibited. Others understood the Ramah saying you're allowing it, but since we asserted, because why did the Ramah argue in Simon Tuff Sound Base? Because he was hosting for different shitas. Some say because there's worry that maybe the egg matzah really could become chametz. And some say, depending on how it's made, if there's water added, it's a big machloka, it's a big debate between the uh, Magen Avram and the Chalk Yaakov versus the Bach and the Maralmi Prague about whether if water is added to the recipe as well, whether that would change the status of egg matzah allowed to be permitted to be eaten or not. So, it's sort of a toss-up. So, so therefore, the Ramah was saying, I'm choshish for this. I, 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 I'm concerned about this. We cannot allow this. So therefore, he means to say that we should treat it like chametz. You can have egg matzah, but it should be only up to a certain point like chametz is on Erev Pesach. What is that point? The Nodi Yehuda holds that he meant until chatzoy sayom, until midday, like the daraisa, until the time you can no longer have chametz at all. Whereas... Most uh, poskim understood to mean until the fourth hour, until Sov's Manachilis Chametz, which, as I mentioned, in Yerushalayim would be 1010, and you can have egg matzah. So if we're following that, that doesn't really help you that much over Chametz. However, Ramosha Feinstein, Tainas, in, his, in, the, in the aforementioned Shuva, that really, that this is the proper solution, and yes, we should eat egg matzah, but we should stop by sov zman achilas chametz. And the one benefit that would have over eating chametz is, it's not chametz. It's chashash, it's a concern, but it's not actual chametz that would make it that it's going to crumb over your house and become usher the achayev and Pesach. Therefore, for, for houses with small children, or perhaps in hotels, they say that this is certainly a preferred option. Of utilizing, excuse me, of utilizing egg matzah, as that would be a better option, at least a more preferential option, than the chametz one, as as uh, as as uh, as many post merits of stroll say is is uh, more optimal. So, so again, so there's four now, but there's actually another concern about egg matzah, which is. Another three, every single debate is really based on another debate over here. What is egg matzah? Egg matzah essentially is a cracker. Now we know there's even there's many Sephardim who would hold that even regular matzah itself 
we would not make a hamotzi on except for the fact that on Pesach mandates us to eat it, therefore it becomes hamotzi. So what about egg matzo? Is egg matzo any better? Answer? Questionable. So egg matzo itself, if you eat it by itself, is regularly your mizonos. It's not a hamotzi. So how can I have a whole Shabbos suda just eating, or even three sudas, like the Shulchan Aruch would say, or at least the Shal Shudas, with egg matzo if it's only mizonos, not a motzi? How can I sit down and have a, a suda on it? And this is another debate in Kuf Samaches, is whether or not something that's called Pasa Bob which is a type of a, a, a mizonos bread with a pocket, is the actual translation, there's the different machlokes of what the words exactly mean, but it means it's not only something that is kneaded with fruit juice instead of with water, that's not an actual hamotzi, but mizonos you can, is really mizonos unless you're koveya suda on it, which means you have to sit down and eat a large suda with it. And there's a debate there, the Magan Avram holds, and it means if you eat a suda with everything else as part of a suda. But others hold, the Shulchan Kharab and the Aruch HaShulchan say, no, it means in the bread item itself. You have to eat a full suda's worth of bread item itself to equal, a, to turn into a hamotzi. There's a sefer called Sefer Kezayis HaSholem uh, from Rabbi Bodner, who, who estimated how much of that is of a mshimat. So he says it would be roughly 15 grams, which is four-tenths of a matzah, is a kezayis. So if one would have the sheer kaviyah suda of if we pass against four kibetzim, they would need to have almost four full egg matzahs at each suda to make sure it's hamosi. That's a big question. So does that, what do we do over here? So both Ramosha Feinstein and his tshuva, as well as Mordechai Gifter in his Pirkei Melid, the famous tells the Rosh Hashiva, they say, no, it's not a problem over here. Because there's another machlokas of whether Shabbos, the Shari Tshuva over there brings it down, through machlokas, whether some, it's because of Shabbos or Erev Pesach changes the status. If you're sitting down for a suda that's a chiyuv on Shabbos, even when then everyone would agree to the Magen Avram Shita. So although that itself is debated, but since here that is a chiyuv of a Shabbos suda for Erev Pesach, both Ramosha rules that this is the preferred option, and no one does not have to eat that much. Or you could eat a regular kazayas, and some say even a kibetos, even one egg matzo would certainly be sufficient, according to this understanding, of being able to make hamotz. So there we have two separate options, whether to go with the chametz option and quickly clear it away, or to have egg matzo. Both of those, though, as we say, on a practical level, have to be finished by Sov Zman Achilas Chametz. So now, let's get back to Shalashudis. Is there any other Mahalech, and is there any other way to be Mekayan to probably fulfill Shalashudis? If we finish our Suda, we have to do one Suda in the morning, or two. Is there any other way to do it in the afternoon? Or to, to host, your, to have your Shalashudis in a proper manner? So there's another question. The Mogan Avram brings down from the Maharil, he asked another question. The Toysus brought down that he said, any matzah that you cannot use for the Seder, you can, you can technically eat on Erev Pesach. It's not considered a matzah. So the option there was given as egg matzah. So many asked, why did he say cooked matzah? Because there's a halal, the Gemara in Bracha, as we paskin, is that cooked matzah is also not considered a matzah. And in fact, there are many ask, and, and the Maral says, Lo Nagukain. Shulchan Rav says, That's not the minute. We don't do it. I mean, take a whole matzah, and we put it into your pot, maybe your chalon, and cook the matzah, and you take it out of Kazais. Now, Bavadi Yosef writes that he believes this is a preferred option. You come to muscle much, many less questions with it. However, again, the Vilna Gon rules you can't do that, and many objected to this specific case because it has the tam matzah, it's too much of a matzah, it's a kazayas of a real matzah, it's just cooked, it's not changed enough. Egg matzah is changed in its actual makeup. Here's a full matzah, and I'm taking it, I'm just cooking it. How changed is it really? Therefore, many are very, um, they do not, they look at this with their scans, or whatever, if it is not the correct term, but they do not view it as this is the proper solution to do it. Though, there are those who do, even the, or, or the, Rabbi Yaakov Hillel in his Avat Shalom Luach, he writes that it's not really such a great solution because anyway it will crumble inside the pot. Generally speaking, if you put matzah and you cook it, it will sort of slowly disintegrate. At that point, you're not really going to have much of a kezayis left in, a, in order to be able to salvage that. Therefore, that's not such a great solution.
But this does lead to a potential other solution, and that is kneblach, matzo balls. There are many poskin, later posts starting from the Chai Adam to the Derech HaChayim, the Kitzur Shulchan Aruch. They bring down, even the Mishra Buru brings down two several occasions that perhaps a great method to do is you make Knedlach. Now, it's debatable whether those, as I said before, that for those who are Hasidish may not help. If you're Makhbet on Gibrux, although, since it's only Erev Pesach, there are those, such as the Sharm Asyon B'Halach, who say this should not be a problem, they kosher the Pesach Matzah both on Erev Pesach, only the rest of Pesach. But it seems that many others do not necessarily agree with that, and even Rebbe Zephaim Zunfeld said that this is only for those who are not Makhbet on Gibrux. But this could be a, if for those who are not Makhbet on Gibrux, to take a nice kosher of Pesach, Matzah ball. How would you? How are matzah balls made? Well, for those who allow matzah mivushel as cooked matzah, this is certainly a far better proposition. Why? Because if you're taking the matzah, you're crumbling it up, you're mixing with eggs and oil and other ingredients, and then you're recooking it instead as a new entity. It becomes a mizonos, but it's not going to be able to be koveya suda on it. That, that means that if you want to have shalashudas, whether or not you split the morning meal, you can technically speaking after Davin early mincha until the tenth hour. So when, until when all bread or matzah-based products are now prohibited, so you have a few hours in the afternoon. You could have mincha gedola say twelve thirty or whatever one thirty, and then you can have the next hour. You can have eat matzah balls. So you might say, "Well, wh what do I need that for?" And the answer is because if you learn back to the halachas of shal shudis, there's like a tiered system. The best way of doing shal shudis is hamotzi. You can't do hamotzi. You can do Mizonos. You can't do Mizonos, you do Shahako. So instead of skipping only to the third option of just having in the afternoon, which technically you can eat much later, by the way, you know, a, a Shahako Pesach cake or chicken or some fish, as long as you, as, as, as Lola Yamali craves like you say, you shouldn't stuff yourself so you still have an appetite for the Seder. But technically speaking, until the 10th hour in the mid afternoon, you're able to also. You're able to also have matzo balls, and that way it's be so higher up on the list. So if, if you split your two sudas, and then e whether or not you do that, you could do that to cover your bases. That way, at least if you hold that this works, and again, the, the Vilna Gon, though he said that cooked matzahs, not others want to argue, and they say he only meant with actual full matzahs being cooked, but not actual matzo balls that are turned, the kneilach are turned into a, a separate entity that is Mazon, so that can never actually become a mozi. Therefore, as Chayra, that would be a better option. Many bring that down, that either in addition to, that a way for an Ashkenazi to be able to have at least a Mizon of Shal Shudis after uh, a Mincha Gedola. There also is another opinion, which is brought down from the Shla, quoting Rib Shimon Bar Yochai, that he says that he helped, he would learn Tyra. He would Isaac a Tyra in the afternoon as a Shal Shudis. Which meaning, as Arafa Shulchan quotes it, the uh, he says that this proves that there's no real solution over here because, as I said, there's no one world answer, there's so much conflicting. Can you do like this, and you're not fulfilling like this according to this sheet, not that sheet, which is the preferred option? So, therefore, we're sort of there's no way out essentially. So, one way else always is to be Isaac the Torah to learn Torah properly. You can be Yotze that way. The ancestor of the Chida, Rabbi Mazula, writes it says, Mitzvah. The most optimal manner to do it. Of course, whether or not we, whichever version of Shalashim to do, it's always to learn in the afternoon. It's not going to hurt. Uh, it's not going to hurt either way, but uh, definitely is a wonderful option. Now, uh, there, you know, though we mentioned, or sort of uh, only a few minutes left, um, I mentioned before that there is, I would say this is the busiest day of the year, but once it hits past that Mincha Kitano, and if we already did, the mincha, daven mincha, mincha dola, so essentially there's nothing else left to do for the rest of the day. Which means, if it started off as perhaps a busy day, you're getting up ultra early and dominates and splitting sudas and how you're doing with chametz or matzah, whichever one doing, and even kneidlach in the afternoon. But at least at that point, there's nothing else to do, but you can take a nap. Then we'd be rested up for the Seder. Of course, since it's, you shouldn't say, I'm doing a hachana, I'm preparing myself for the Seder, but definitely a, a well-earned, well-deserved Shabbos nap would certainly go a long way to uh, helping out them be ready at, uh, for the Seder. Uh, another important reminder for this marathon Shabbos, and since the Shabbos is right uh, coming up as ending Shabbos for Pesach, you make sure that you say uh, after Tzitzik HaKovim, when Shabbos actually ends, you should make sure to say, Hamavdu ben Kodesh the Kodesh, 
or a part of Meyer Vatodienu to make sure you're separating between Gdusha Shabbos, Gdusha's Yantav of Pesach, in order to be able to now for finish your prep work, of course, for those who haven't, you know, set up the table like Royce Fein's Lanafel from before Shabbos, of course, set up the Seder. But um, that definitely is a preferred, um, um, that's not preferred, that's man halakhly mandated, make sure we say that before we start our actual Pesach. One last halacha is that in Kiddush itself, and one of the most interesting things this year was the Yaq Nahaz. That is a special Kiddush Havdalah, stands for Yayin Kiddush Ner Havdalah Zman, which is, a, which is a special hybrid Kiddush slash Havdalah that we have, that we make as it will be part of Kadesh at the Seder to, um, to, uh, to sort of usher Shabbos out and usher in uh, Pesach. Now, in this year, is actually five of them in uh, Chutzars, two in Eretz Yisrael. But the first day of Pesach will be a Yak Nehaz, and in Chutzar Sen will be a Yak Neh, because there's no Zman, no Brach of Shechianu in Kiddush on the last days of Pesach. Um, the Shapir should be aware of that for what they call a Yak Nehaz candle. Um, nowadays, they sell these called Yak Nehaz candles, candles, small little teeny candles with uh, more than one wick. That way, since on Yontif, as opposed to Shabbos, you can transfer flame. Therefore, you can transfer it to make sure you have a yard site candle set up for ready for before Shabbos. It's another important prep uh, work that's done before Shabbos. Perhaps if you can get a 48 hour candle, so it lasts for two days, so make sure you don't have to come with any problems. Once it's ready, Yantif, and you already said, I'm out of the Kodesh, the Kodesh, you can light the candle, and you can use that, it'll burn out by itself. Now, the olden days, you didn't have it. Some say it's better just to light, with just, just to make the bracha of Borei Morei Ha'esh on one candle. Others say that you can put two matches together, but there's all sorts of problems with the keyboard or can't make sure they don't melt. There's also different sheets with it of what to do. Make sure you ask your local rabbi which is the preferred option for you or your community of how to do it. But they say when they showed Rabbi Yashiv the Yakna has candle way that you don't come to any Shilas with it, it has two wicks and little teeny things. You no, know, they sell them all over. I mean, here they sell them in shuls uh, for very, they're very cheap. Then and it burns itself out. You don't have to worry about extinguishing, which of course will be a problem whether on Shabbos or Yantif. They say Rabbi Yashu's face lit up with joy. And uh, just to end with uh, one last uh, uh, thought, it's not really. Uh, if you know, if people notice in the illuminated fancy Haggadahs back in the day, the the uh, Praga Gada, Cincinnati Gada, when it comes to Kiddush, says Yaknahaz, it would show a picture of a rabbit hunt. And people always ask, why is there a rabbit? You know, you know. Rabbits aren't kosher. Why would it be a rabbit hunt sitting here in the middle of my Haggadah? You can look this up. You know, all these fancy pictures of Haggadahs they always put up. Um, and one of the reasons to say in, in, the, in, in German, Yagden Haz, chase the rabbit, sounds very much like Yagden Haz. So you see that even for these people who authored, who, who drew, or these little fancy illuminated Haggadahs had a sense of humor, then it reminded people in a whimsical manner that when it, you have Shabbos, Pesach, Chaliyot, the Arab, they then you have uh, uh, Pesach that falls on a Sunday. In such a case, then uh, then there's a room to go manage to remember the right order and what to do to make sure you have your proper the proper order of Yayin, Kiddush, Ner, Havdol, Zman in Kiddush. I would like to conclude with uh, thanking uh, Rabbani and the Orsamech International team once again for this wonderful seminar and uh, we should be Zolche. To be uh, to be able to be and uh, Zvachim and Psachim, some switch the order this year to Psachim and Zvachim, and uh, it should be uh, uh, to do the proper order in the rebuild base of Mikdash. Meher of Yemenu Amen. Thank you very much. Rabbi Spitz, thank you very much. It was a really a fantastic presentation and will be helpful to all of us. Uh, that concludes this year's first or Sameach virtual pre Pesach seminar. Once again, all the lectures will be available, including Rabbi Spitz in 24 hours at or.edu. And special thanks again to Mrs. Nechama Kahana and Rabbi Avi Kaufman. Without their efforts, this program would not have taken place. So thank you, and we look forward to seeing you soon.